Noctala, persistent echo, marginalized voice, contemporary reverberation. Veskama ahula dunya, thalcha orav ula. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I am very pleased to have an opportunity to delve more deeply into Gaelic publishing in Nova Scotia. Mactala, an iconic late 19th, early 20th century Nova Scotian newspaper, celebrates the unheeded, often unseen, voices of a lesser known culture. I believe this aligns well with the conference theme of exploring relations of the book. It addresses a distinctive, marginalized community's need for a place to have their own conversation. Today I will be looking at this title from several viewpoints. Among other claims, the pages of Maktala include contributions from many of the important scholars of the day as well as community tradition bearers. It was an impressive accomplishment in its day, however what strikes me is the continued value it holds for scholars up to the present. My talk is structured into three segments. Firstly, I will have a brief look at the context to give some understanding of why it existed. I will present some data about language use in the community of its origin. The status of the language in both Scotland and Canada, in particular in the Maritimes, will also be mentioned. My second focus, research, will examine some of the publications scholars have written with the aid of its content over the last century and more. Lastly, I will share some examples of the contemporary and creative uses of Mactala involving modern communication and digital humanities projects. To begin, I present a brief glimpse of the world in which Mactala existed. So, some basic facts to begin. The longevity of the paper, despite financial difficulties and the immense amount of work required by one individual, is often presented as a marvel. In addition to those obstacles, it was in a marginalized language and its audience was geographically dispersed. The subscription base is somewhat reflective of the Gaelic diaspora, as might be expected, but it was also popular in Scotland. It is worth noting that the inclusion of somewhere in the vicinity of 3,000 songs, while unusual in a newspaper, is not surprising at all in a Gaelic publication. Songs, or more accurately, poems, are central to understanding Gaelic culture. Poems were composed and transmitted orally and were said to be made, not written, and were meant to be sung. The Reverend Alexander MacLean Sinclair, distinguished and prolific Nova Scotian scholar, wrote in 1889, and I quote, But where are we to learn what the manners and customs of the old Highlanders were? We are a thousand times more dependent upon old Gaelic poems than the Irish. The true history of the Highlanders can be found in their poems and nowhere else. In Dr. Michael Kennedy's groundbreaking 2002 report, Gaelic Nova Scotia, an Economic, Cultural and Social Impact Study, a map representing the distribution of Gaelic bards was included. The inclusion of data like that speaks to the importance of the bardic tradition and explains in some measure the inclusion of so much poetry and song in the pages of Magdala. The estimate for the number of Gaelic speakers in Canada in the late 19th century is given as 250,000. The areas of Canada where the language existed are represented in the dots on the map. The regions highlighted, apart from the Maritimes, include the Codroy Valley in Newfoundland, Eastern Townships in Quebec, Glengarry County in Ontario, as well as Vancouver and Winnipeg. The second one is a more detailed map of the situation in the Maritimes. It is clear from this data that there was a significant population base with the language at the time of the publication. While literacy in Gaelic was not widespread, there are stories of the paper being read aloud for the benefit of the listeners. In fact, that contributed to the lack of financial success. Papers were frequently shared and not purchased. A closer look at Cape Breton specifically shows Gaelic in comparison to English, French, and Mi'kmaq. We can see that Gaelic was on an almost equal footing to English. The second map shows the situation in eastern Nova Scotia and demonstrates the areas where the language was strongest. To explain why I'm using the word marginalized with respect to this language and community, 
I will quote from both Scottish and Nova Scotian sources. John Lauren Campbell, a noted Gaelic scholar from Scotland, describes the situation in this way. In one important social aspect, Gaelic is different from many other non-English languages in America, such as the French of Quebec and the German of Pennsylvania. The parent language in its old country had, until recently, a status no better than it enjoys in the new land. Gaelic in Scotland has been under official disapproval for nearly 400 years. Due at first to the identification of Gaelic culture with Catholicism, later to the triumph of Whiggery over Jacobitism, and to the spirit of utilitarianism. Dr. Robert Dunbar, Chair of Celtic Languages, Literature, Histories and Antiquities, University of Edinburgh, states in a, in a recent presentation, McKinnon negotiated the frequently challenging relationship between a stigmatized minority culture, which had for a century and a half suffered a series of social, cultural, linguistic and economic dislocation within the dominant Anglophone British Empire at the height of its power. So, there is a long history of oppression. It continued in North America and the settlers brought their experiences and long memories with them. Some interesting parallels can be drawn with the experiences of Indigenous peoples with respect to how the language was treated by educational institutions. The situation is described in the following passage from Kennedy's 2002 report. How children were discouraged from using Gaelic in schools depended very much upon the individual teacher. There was no proscribed policy. Instances of corporal punishment have been noted, but the more common technique appears to have been social humiliation. One Gaelic speaker remembered how, when he first attended school during this era, his teacher angrily informed the Gaelic-speaking children that they were not speaking a real language, but merely a type of gibberish. In some districts, Gaelic children caught speaking the language were required by children, by their teachers, to wear a shingle around their neck, the equivalent of a dunce cap, and could remove the sign of, the stupidi of their stupidity only by catching someone else speaking Gaelic. In some schools, children who had transgressed the no Gaelic rule were assembled at the end of the day and administered corporal punishment for their misbehavior. More often than not, the embarrassment of wearing the badge of shame was considered a sufficient deterrent, as can be judged by the testimony of Joe Kennedy of Inverside, who related that Gaelic-speaking children in the area of Inverness during the, this period were known by the term of contempt, the shingles, by their English-speaking schoolmates. The school system's success in associating Gaelic with stupidity, socially, socially undesirable behavior, fear, tattling, physical punishment, embarrassment, and a whole host of other negatives, negatives created another significant obstacle for those attempting to promote a greater use of the language in the school system. It is likely no coincidence that the students who came through the school system during this period are credited for actively discouraging the use of Gaelic in their own homes from the 1930s onward. Jonathan McKinnon and John Lauren Campbell, pictured here, had a fruitful, collaborative, and mutually respectful relationship. Here we see them during one of Campbell's several trips to Cape Breton. Campbell wrote this article in a Scottish newspaper in 1933. The last paragraph is poignant. Not forgotten, Mactala has now been dead for more than a generation and is in danger of becoming entirely forgotten. Its editor is happily still alive and has never ceased his efforts on behalf of the Gaelic language and letters with unfortunately no adequate reward for them. It goes on to say, Certainly, few men have done more in their time for Gaelic letters than MacKinnon, and it is much to be hoped that all who love the Gaelic will not permit that either he or his work shall become forgotten here in Scotland. As I hope to show, he and his paper have not been forgotten many years later. Now I will move on to the second part of my talk. I will discuss some research activity connected with Maktala. Maktala holds an immense amount of material of interest to scholars from diverse fields. A search on Google Scholar produces an impressive array of citations, both in numbers and topics explored. This somewhat rough method of gathering data does give an indication of its research use, provides a good starting point. A quick search of Google Scholar with the term Maktala provides about 260 citations. 
While not every one of these items is pertinent, most are connected to it. There are nine publications listed since 2020, 11 more between 2017 and 2020, ranging from studies on gravestones to dancing traditions. Makes me think of the phrase dancing on a grave, but anyway. The researchers are based in several countries as far flung as Japan. The earliest publication I found was from 1904. The word cloud shows some of the categories these works encompass. People have made use of the advertising to research neologisms, as the Gales experienced new technologies and items not previously encountered. An example is the word for a bicycle, rower. In fact, there is a column of useful new words for the various parts of the bicycle. I have listed a few examples of the more recent citations in this slide. A rough index including the listings of topics in each issue was produced a number of years ago. A review of this index in each issue gave me a good idea of the type of content included. There is a lot of interest in economic development and labour issues associated with new industry. The opening of the steel plant in Sydney and the consequent immigration from many parts of the world garnered a lot of attention. Genealogical matters and accounts of the first settlers provide information that in many cases doesn't exist elsewhere. Politics is a favourite topic, but as with religion, the attempt to keep it non-partisan was important. There's material about the indigenous people, particularly in relation to the relationships to the Gaels. One item describes an indigenous person living in Medec who speaks Gaelic, French, English, in addition to his own beautiful mother tongue, Micmac, and notes that it isn't an unusual circumstance. It has also been very significant for scholars who study songs and poetry, given the nature of oral transmission. The printed versions are extremely valuable for making comparisons among the extant versions. Some researchers without knowledge of the language have collaborated with Gaelic speakers and translators to mine the materials presented in the pages. A seminal work, Beyond the Atlantic Roar, a study of Nova Scotia Scots, cites Machtala and gives credit to the translator. Some well-known literature was also translated for people to enjoy as well. Now I'll move on to the contemporary use section. This, this will deal with uh, how Mactala reverberates up to the present day in new and unexpected ways. It has made the leap to the modern age in several interesting ways. To begin, it has been digitized and put online by Saul Morostik, the Gaelic College in Sky, both PDF and text versions by whole issue or by page, and downloading capability make it easy for researchers to use. The first project I will highlight is Language and Lyrics, led by Canada Research Chair in Musical Traditions, Dr. Heather Starling, Sparling at Cape Breton University. This project has drawn extensively from the songs printed in the paper. As stated on the website, it is a three-year funded project working to create a comprehensive database of Gaelic songs in Nova Scotia. We are compiling the Nova Scotia Gaelic Music Database by drawing from print media, archive recordings, and private collections. The long-term goal of the project is to lay the foundations for a corpus of Nova Scotia Gaelic, which can be used for research, analysis, and a potential future dictionary of Nova Scotia Gaelic. The description of the prototype database says, It is a simplified excerpt of the index created with song data from Mactella. This excerpt contains 100 songs in alphabetical order featured in Mactella, Volume 6, 1897-1898. Ballon and Gale, or the Nova Scotia, Gale, Nova Scotia Highland Village Museum, has online sessions using Facebook and Zoom, where participants read and translate passages from the publication guided by staff. And this is an advertisement that they have on um, in the local uh, publications to get people interested. Here we can see one of the recorded sessions, which had 1.1 thousand views. This endeavor has garnered a good number of participants from several countries as well. These recordings will contribute to the growing list of Gaelic learning resources. The museum publication, Arua, 
also uses Maktala. Articles are printed in Gaelic as they originally appeared in Maktala with an English translation provided. The late Jim Watson, Gaelic tradition bearer and former manager of interpretation at the village, pictured on the right wearing the hat, offered these words in an interview. We try to provide something that is kind of entertaining or might evoke some kind of discussion about an aspect of Gaelic culture. Some pieces are also chosen because of brevity. This is yet another example of its use as a learning tool, as well as a way to transmit cultural values. University of Glasgow's DASC, or Digital Archive of Scottish Gaelic, has incorporated Maktala into its online digital repository of texts. This site provides a new tool which promises to encourage new exploration of the publication. Its inclusion also adds to the recognition of the paper. It may provide a way to compare any changes in the language in Nova Scotia as compared with Scotland. Searching can be restricted to the single publication and the slide shows how searches can be conducted. This is an example of a search for Dunya Dua, which means black man, men. The file names correspond to different publications and Maktala is represented by the 80,000 block of numbers, so clicking on the link will provide detail. This one shows the newspaper item in full, as well as information about the publication itself. This is a good segue to my last example. A Gaelic learner's blog created by Thomas McAlpin, who also worked on DASC, includes a posting in which Maktala is used extensively. It is concerning the Black Lives Movement, pardon me, the Black Lives Matter movement. Several excerpts concerning news items about blacks running a gamut of topics are shared. Here is an excerpt from the May 1898 issue in translation. James Robinson Johnston, 1876 to 1915. Among those graduating as lawyers at Dalhousie this spring, there was one black man, James Robinson Johnston, the first black man to do so in Nova Scotia. It is not the law or the practice of this country to keep back anyone from his any position if he goes for it no matter who his people are or the color of his skin. One more example from June 1892 that he shared. This one concerns a resident of Colchester, Ontario. Died John Hader, a black man who was 109 years old at Colchester, Ontario last Saturday. He was born in Virginia in 1783 and he came to Colchester 50 years ago. I will conclude this with a quote from Dr. Robert Dunbar about McKinnon's approach to his craft. In many ways, he, as reflected in the use of a newspaper and a journal, the cutting-edge media of the day, a means of perpetuating many aspects of Gaelic history and culture, as well as the language itself, in a worldwide Gaelic community. I am certain that both McKinnon and Campbell would have felt proud of just how loudly their message reverberates today. Warren Tang Goyf, and thanks for listening.